I'm going to be wrapping up our Exodus series. The entire series closes right now. So we are in part 11 of our Discovering God series, and I entitled today's message, So Let It Be Written, So Let It Be Done. Amen? Yeah, Charlton Heston. Woo! Yeah, okay, here we go. Now, we're going to be covering the last six chapters, so over the next three hours, we are going to be, uh, okay, yeah, settle in, all right. Uh, We've been talking throughout this series about a people group that come out of slavery, and they're told they're the precious chosen people of God. Well, they certainly don't feel like that. They feel abandoned. They feel lost. They feel ignored. And now all of a sudden they're drawn to a mountain of God and he begins to tell them who he is and they kind of freak out about it. And they're in this weird mind bending concept of shifting identity from that of an abandoned slave to a precious child. As we've been watching kind of them go on this journey, we're realizing, wait, 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 there's a lot we can apply. Because many of us, we were captured by Jesus, by his love, and we were told we were precious, but we didn't come from an environment feeling precious at all. As a matter of fact, you're being told now that you are a child of God. You're being told that the Holy Spirit is within you. You're being told that you've been rescued, that you have a purpose that you have meaning. And a lot of us are going, man, those clothes don't fit. Well, when we go through that journey of understanding who we are in Christ, as we know God more and know his Holy Spirit more and know Jesus more, things start to make sense. So we've been doing a lot of connections there and we're gonna try to carry that on as we close it out. So I wanna begin with a concept. God wants to be near his people. Do you believe that? Because sometimes we do and sometimes we don't. Too often our prayers kind of seem to start around the idea that we have to convince God to listen to them, right? Well, God, if you would just listen to me, if you would just hear me, I will do all sorts of stuff. It's like we're bargaining with him, like he doesn't really want to be near us. Well, Lord, I understand that I am faulty. I understand I'm a sinner. But if you would be so nice as to show up and maybe be near me. The whole time, God's like, the only reason you want me to be near you is I want to be near you, and I told you I wanted to be near you. How do we know that God wants to be near us? Well, there's a very simple biblical reason. The whole Bible begins in the Garden of Eden. God is walking with Adam and Eve, and everything's good. There is no sin, there's no separation. It's almost like when Jesus walked on earth, but in a perfect environment. It says that God came walking in the cool of the day through the Garden of Eden. They could just talk and dialogue and connect bodily, physical manifestation. And they're able to ask him questions and bond. Well, we know sin ruined that. But if you go to the last book of the Bible, which is the book of Revelation, you end up finding out that we're back in a perfect scenario. God has removed sin. He's removed the enemy. God has wiped away every tear. He's cleared out all the pain. Everything is healing, everything is whole, and God says, I am with my people and they will dwell with me forever. So we started near him, we're ending near him, therefore you can be assured that in between, he is doing something every moment to get as close as he possibly can to his kiddos, and that is us, God wants to be near us. So the question then bounces back to us. Do you want more of God? Now, Moses did, but the Israelites did not. That's where they're at in their journey. I don't know where you're at in your journey. If you remember, the Israelites, when God talked to them directly, they said, he's too scary. Tell him not to talk to us anymore. Get him to back up. He can talk to you, Moses. You can talk to us. But they wanted distance. 
Whereas Moses kept saying things like, show me your glory, tell me your name, I want more of you, can I have more of you, right? What's the difference? You know, it's interesting because the Israelites viewed God as limitation, rules, regulations, fear. If you view God that way, you're gonna wrestle with intimacy. But Moses saw God as the ultimate good, the only source of life, the only source of beauty, and he wanted more of it. So how you view God is critical to how close you're gonna wanna be with him. So that's my question for you. Do you want more of God? Depends on how you see him. I'm trying to make sure that here at Bridgeway as we walk through God's word, that you see him more rightly so you can more correctly assess Do I want to be closer and closer and closer to him? That's what we're gonna push here at Bridgeway is a personal relationship with God, yeah? I mean, that's what it's all about. If you want more of God, how do you get it? How do you get more presence? How do you get more connection with him? You have to remember, we're not in charge. We can't command anything. We are not the parent in this relationship. It's God or nothing. If he doesn't draw close, we don't got him. That's it. So how do you get more of him? as opposed to simply just asking. I think that's a good start. But here's a couple concepts I wanted to talk about. I don't believe that simply being available is usually enough. What do I mean by that? Well, some of us grew up in conservative environments, right? And when I mean conservative, I'm talking about not so much charismatic environments, right? So what we were taught is to be nervous or wary of anything that's supernatural, because it could be demonic, (laughs) right? So we want all that God has as long as our hands don't have to raise above this, (laughs) right? Well, when you have that and you're always trying to avoid, you don't want to be a hard-hearted, resistant person. So here's what you tell God. God, I want all of you, as long as it's legit, and uh, I'm here if you want me. Well, well done for you, okay. God's like, really? That was so nice of you. Okay, I don't think that's enough. Does God operate in a way where he does come upon people even though they're not necessarily wanting it? Yes. But what I see in the Bible from Paul the Apostle, from Jesus Christ, is ask, seek, knock, pursue. That's what I see. This whole idea of I'm available, Lord, if you're willing to uncross my arms and change my skeptical heart, I just don't think is gonna cut it. I think that what we need to do is lean in to what he is and who he is. I think we need to stop making all the boundaries and the parameters to tell him what he can and can't do. I think we need to lean into him and say, God, I want you. And if it comes in a packaging that I'm not quite comfortable with, I guess I'm gonna have to deal with that. Because I really believe that if we want more of God, we need to be willing to walk with God, no matter what that means. The second thing that I notice is that we cannot bring the fire. Our job is to prepare the altar, yes? On Mount Carmel, Elijah, the prophet, is doing a showdown with the prophets of Baal. Who can bring fire down? Elijah knows he does not call fire down. He doesn't know how to do that, but God does. So he spent most of his time preparing the altar the way God wanted it. Then God would respond with fire. So what is our job? Our job is to prepare our hearts, our homes, our church, in such a way fit for a king. Our job is to say, if a king was going to arrive, is it all set up and ready for him to roll in? Is there a place for his power to move? Are we so full of ourselves, the Holy Spirit can't even get in there? Or are we emptied so the Holy Spirit has a lot of room to move and operate? I would suggest to you that what we do is set the table. He gets to decide if he's showing up for dinner. Y'all know what I'm talking about? But I think that there is an active participation on our part to engage with the presence of God. What's the bottom line? Fill in the blank on the sheet in front of you. We must prepare for God's presence. We must prepare for God's presence. This week, as we are closing out the series, you realize Israel has not gone anywhere from the mountain. They haven't started the process of going to the promised land. 
And you gotta say, well, why is God taking so much time here? We have the whole book of Exodus and we haven't gone anywhere. Now, this is my opinion. It's not what the scholars all say, but this is my opinion. I believe God doesn't wanna leave from the mountain until he's sure that the golden calf thing isn't gonna happen again. You remember last week we were together, the golden calf thing was such a debacle. You had them rejecting God wholeheartedly, attributing all his miraculous rescue to another God and turning their backs completely on him. That is horrifying. Why did they do that? Because they had no relationship with him. God said, I don't wanna move from this mountain. I don't wanna head to the promised land until we have some semblance of a relationship because otherwise it's just gonna get crazy. How was God going to build a relationship with his people? Well, he had to draw near. So he had Moses build him a tabernacle. And that was a place where God's presence would come close. And everybody in the camp would know, my God's with me. And that would begin a relationship that they would have to struggle through. We'll find out for the next 40 years. Now you go, wait, I thought we covered the tabernacle. Hold on. Two weeks ago, Pastor Matt Bach came in here and beautifully laid out how a tabernacle was set up and why it's powerful. Here's the point. That was just a dialogue with God on a mountain. Nobody built anything. As a matter of fact, it's all schematics. It's all maps. It's all details. Nobody's building anything until now. But God said, before we get started, I want my house built. Then we can go because you need me in your midst. All right, let's dive in. Would you turn with me to Exodus chapter 35, verse four? Exodus 35, verse four. How in the world are they going to make this incredible tabernacle, which is basically a mobile temple? How are they going to make this thing there's no markets around. There's no other place to buy anything. Nobody's got a job. And we have 1.5 to 2 million people in the desert. So how's this going to work? Well, here you go. Moses said to all the congregation of the people of Israel, this is the thing that the Lord has commanded. Take from among you a contribution to Yahweh, whoever is of a generous heart. Hmm. They're gonna do a building project. Woohoo! Campaign time, right? You're like, that's what I love most about church. Anytime they do a building campaign. So they're gonna do a building campaign. It's kind of weird. Like I said, nobody has a job. So they're gonna get a bunch of stuff. But here's what is most intriguing about it God commands them to build him something. Does that rub anybody wrong? Does that seem odd? Because depending on your relationship with God, it either sounds totally normal or it sounds super sketchy. What I would like to do is tie that into a very common question that skeptics have about Christianity. I don't know if I want to serve a God who demands that I worship him, right? Because that is really the case. And you will love me, the Lord your God, with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. As a matter of fact, what he said was, if you do not love me and you do not worship me, you are never going to be with me for eternity. That sounds pretty hardcore. And you're like, well, that is no way to ask me on a date. <laughs> That's very pushy. Now, we could simply say, yeah, but he's God and you're not, and he's allowed to say whatever he wants, and he calls the shots, he sets up the rules. But God is more loving than that. So let's answer the question. Is it okay for God to demand worship? Is it okay for God to say, you will build me a place, and it's gonna be super nice? Is he allowed to do that? Yes, why? Because we desperately need it. God is the only good in our reality. If you do not have him, you have no good. He is the only life in all of our reality. If you don't have him, there's no life. 
What's the point? He's the best thing for us, and when he demands we worship him, it means we can come alive. His demand of worship is saying, kiddos, you need to worship me. It brings you alive. It makes you who I built you to be. I'm not trying to be egotistical. I'm trying to explain to you that when you connect with me, all of your systems begin to fire. I built you to be plugged into me. I can't have you exist outside of that. I must demand that for you to be human, for you to be anything of what I made, you must be connected to me. You must love me because then my power can flow into you, my life can flow into you, and you will be everything you were supposed to be. I don't think it's arrogant at all. I think it is the greatest act of kindness to let us worship him. You know, it, all this stuff filters down to people saying, I can't believe Christianity is so narrow-minded. Man, like there's other people like, the Hindus are cool, like if I, I do my own thing, and the Buddhists are cool if I do my own thing. Christianity is so restrictive. It's so narrow. It's like my way or the highway. You either do this or go to hell. I don't like that. Okay, hold on a second. There is a God, the only God, the one God. You either have him or you don't. He sent his only son. There's only one Savior that ever showed up. It's not trying to be restrictive. It's trying to rescue your life. And if you want multiple options of rescue, clearly you don't see you're in danger. If a firefighter breaks into a burning home and starts to drag you out and you go, no, 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 another door. <laughs> you are not sufficiently afraid. Does that make sense? I don't think you grasp your situation. I'm the only dude that came in to drag you out and I'm going out this door. That's how it works, right? All right. Uh, a couple other things. He said, all right, we're gonna do a big building campaign and here's what we need. We need precious metals, yarn, linen, hides. The animals are like, what? Right? <laughs> Wood, oils, spices, and setting stones. This is what we need to make this place. Okay, then he says, I don't just need stuff, I need workers. So look at verse 10. Let every skillful craftsman among you come and make all the Lord has commanded. All right, let's pause. Did he say, let anyone that has a sweet heart come and make my tabernacle? <laughs> nope, he's like, yeah, I need someone legit. I need the best making my stuff. What I don't need is some guy going, totally love the Lord, and I made you a box. You're like, that's not a box. The lid doesn't fit. Well, it's kind of fits. He's like, no, I don't want that. I want a skilled craftsman who's super good. I want someone that knows how to measure and cut, right? I want to know someone that knows how to embroider a cherubim on a curtain, and at the end, people don't go, a butterfly. Like, you better be excellent at what you do or don't touch my stuff. Because what you don't understand is everything I'm creating here in this tabernacle has a deeper spiritual meaning. And if you alter it in any way, it screws up the deeper meaning. So I need you to do it exactly. I want skilled craftsmen to come in and do my stuff because this is bigger than just, oh, I like to play with wood. Oh, I like to work with metals. I don't know, are you brilliant or not? If you're not brilliant, get off the job. That's not what we're doing here. And he needed embroiderers, metal workers, carpenters, seamstresses. Why? Because he was using the whole body and their gifts and their talents to build him something glorious. You know, he still does that today, yeah? As a matter of fact, he's using you. We're gonna talk in a little bit about how powerful it is of what he's built in you, but I need you to understand your gifts and talents and abilities are critical here. Now, it may not always be in the job or role that you want. So let's talk about that for a second. 
Too often we think that anyone that has a good heart should be allowed on stage. That is incorrect. Let's talk about the worship team for a second, right? Because that's kind of a, a little showcase. It's kind of like, oh, I love music. I sing in my car all the time. I would be awesome up there. All right, let me tell you what their job is and then we can determine whether or not you're a good fit for that job. See, when somebody does something well, it always appears easy until you see what they do. So here's what a worship team does. A worship team are worship leaders. They are not there to worship. If we're gonna say we need worshipers, that's actually all of us. If we were just worshipers, it's the entire congregation. All of us worship. Their job is not to worship, their job is to get us to worship. Now here's what's intriguing about trying to lead a worship set in music to a big group of people. Everyone's easily distracted. Everybody's got their own hangups, right? Oh my gosh, I don't like this song. Oh my gosh, I don't know this one. Oh my gosh, I can't read the lyrics. Oh my gosh, that they're going too fast. Oh my gosh, I can't even understand what the harmony is. Oh my gosh, and we have all these things. So you have to have someone so gifted that they are not distracting you and pulling you out of worship. If they do their job excellent, they disappear. Why? They inspire you, you're watching them worship, they inspire you, and then voom, they're gone and Jesus shows up. That's actually their job. It is not a performance. A performance says, let me wow you with my vocal range and I'm gonna consistently do things that make the attention go to me. They can't be that. They actually have to have it ricochet right back up to God. They also need to do their craft so brilliantly that they don't have to think about playing the drums while they're leading worship. Well, you gotta be really good in order to do that because I'll tell you, as a drummer, that's not easy. If somebody else adjusts something, they're listening to tracks in their head. There is a click track going at all times. They are listening to something totally different than what you're hearing. And they're playing at all times to keep everybody on rhythm. Why? The moment they miss rhythm, everyone's pulled out of worship. If you are constantly going, man, that girl can't sing. You can't focus on Jesus because you're so focused on her. Why? The whole point of all of this is to present, draw you in, get you undistracted, and draw your attention to the Lord. That's their job. Now you know why there's so few people that are on this stage. It's a crazy job. Meanwhile, they have to simultaneously be connected to heaven and connected to you at the same time. You guys, do you understand why I don't let just anyone come up and preach? Why? Because there's a million opinions on how things should be said. They have to have a certain voice that you can hear. There's a certain pattern that they can track with. There's a way for them to not have to be so attached to their notes and not get completely lost. All of that is distraction. What's our job? Our job is to bring the word of God alive, start a date with Jesus, and get out of the way. That's our job. Meanwhile, the whole time, we're trying to watch and we're figuring out which camera's on at what time, and then we're looking up and there's a clock hanging right over your head. We're watching that too. We're also looking over and seeing that this person just fell asleep. Does that mean I'm terrible or does that mean they have narcolepsy? And then we have to move over here and we have to figure out that person hasn't laughed at one of my jokes. I understand I'm not that funny, but I'm watching you. You have to do all that simultaneously and make it look natural. That's a very small group of people because anyone that's supposed to even start that process has to have a good heart, love God with everything, and love people. It's not easy. But here's what's intriguing to me. The first mention of someone filled with the Holy Spirit then for a direct purpose, and when I say filled, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come and go on people. He would come on a king like King Saul. Then when King Saul blew it, he would lift off Saul and go on David. So there's very few times that he ever would hang out with for long periods of time. The first mention in the Bible, now we knew Moses had it, but it doesn't say that it happened. It just isn't assumed. 
The first time the Bible says the Holy Spirit filled someone for a direct purpose permanently was three or four chapters before where we're at. Here's what it said. Then Yahweh said to Moses, I have called the man named Bezalel from the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the spirit of God. Okay, pause. For what? With ability and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship to devise artistic designs, to work in gold, silver, and bronze, in cutting stones for setting, in carving wood, to work in every craft. The first mention of the Holy Spirit coming upon someone for a task is for working with your hands and art. This is why we must never say, well, there's, it, there's important jobs in the church and the, the pastors, well, they're special because, stop. How God built you and gifted you is just as Holy Spirit inspired as me preaching on this stage. Amen. Same glory rises because you're supposed to do what you're built to do. They're supernatural abilities. You can do things, then you do it easy. You think it's no big deal. It's a big deal. There are some of you that are in the construction industry. You have no idea how supernatural that is. The rest of us can't do it. You see how things are created. You see how infrastructure works. You see what you can move and shift. You know how this works, so therefore I can build this, I can change this. There are some of you that are supernaturally gifted as civil engineers. There are some of you built with architecture. There are some of you that can work with your hands on cars, and it just makes sense to you. But you keep thinking the only people Holy Spirit filled and inspired are preaching. That's incorrect. It's you. It's the same glory. Your job is not to be a preacher. Your job is to be an accountant and to do it for the glory of God. Your job is to work in a garage and do things on cars that no one else can do. Your job is to be in the construction industry and build things for the glory of God. Your job is not to be a worship leader. Your job is to be you. You are so gifted, so Holy Spirit filled, but he did it in different ways. When you look at all the stuff that they built, there was sexy stuff and there was like boring stuff. Have you guys read through the list? Like here's a, here's a sexy job. Hey, can you embroider the cherubim on the curtain? That would be pretty sweet. Hey, can you make the lampstand that is eternally lit before God? That's super cool. Can you make the offering altar where everyone's going to offer their sacrifice before God. All that stuff is legit. But then there's these things. Who's gonna make the poles? Who's gonna make the hooks? Who's gonna make the bases? Those are lame, right? Because you go up and this guy's like, yeah, I was on that project. And you're like, oh, really? What'd you do? I made a hook. Did you now? That's, which hook did you make? Well, it was like 30 seconds over. It's right on the corner. Wow, that's lame. Right? Nobody cares. But without those things, it all falls down. There's no ability to transport the presence of God box without the poles. There's no beautiful curtain of presence without hooks. There's no tent structure without bases. They're not sexy, they're necessary. They're not fancy, they don't get the wows, but they sustain the same amount of glory as the table of showbread. Never see your contribution to the kingdom of God as less than anyone else's. Your job is to be you. Your job is to do what you were built to do. That's how it works. Without IT and tech, there is no streaming of church online. Without sound and lighting, there's no worship atmosphere that can engage a thousand people at a time. 
Without kids' way leaders holding babies, there is no sense of a loving presence of God in the nursery. Without administration, nothing of meaning gets done consistently. We need all the gifts employed to do any work in the ministry. Your job isn't less. Stop comparing. If it wasn't necessary, God wouldn't have asked you to do it. Well, sure enough, now this has all been set up. We got the building project. How is it going to be funded? Here we go. Verse 20. Then all the congregation of the people of Israel departed from the presence of Moses. In other words, they're going to go home and pray about it. And they came back, everyone whose heart stirred him, everyone whose spirit moved him, and brought Yahweh's contribution to be used for the tent of meeting and for all its service and for the holy garments. So they came, both men and women, all who were of a willing heart. How cool that they have a willing heart. People, that nobody was forced to do it. They were like, yeah, I want to contribute. I want to give to the Lord. This is awesome. And how beautiful when a heart is joyfully giving to God, and it's not a, well, I guess I should, right? Oh, 10%, I guess I should. Oh, man, how are we going to work this out? I guess we're going to have to have less. As opposed to, wait, I get to contribute and invest in something that is eternally valuable. Whatever I was about to do, what, what, like for example, I have a boat. Does anybody own a boat? Raise your hand, you ever own a boat? Wow, are you foolish. Okay, so here's the point. Here's what a boat is. It just basically is a money pit, right? It doesn't actually go, you just pay money. Do you understand what I'm saying? So whatever, when I put money, I just had to get my boat out of the shop. When you get your boat out of the shop, well, I don't know, that only means a certain amount, but when I send a kid to Hume Lake Christian Camp, that's eternally valuable. So yeah, I'm spending some money on stuff that matters. I'm spending some money on stuff that doesn't matter. Well, when I get a chance to invest in God's stuff, there's a joy and excitement of going, man, at last, it matters. That's awesome. So these people were super pumped up about that. Well, let's talk about the practical stuff here at Bridgeway. While I was gone, we had the, a business meeting. It was the annual business meeting. We ratified a budget for Bridgeway at $7.4 million. That is a lot of money. $7.4 million. What the heck? That's incredible. Where does that come from? 89% of it is from tithes and offerings. 89%, almost 90%, almost all of it comes from us as a family. Now you have to remember, there's not a whole like massive group of millionaires going, oh, and they're throwing money in the air and Scrooge McDuck walks by and, right? This is just people bringing loaves and fishes. Now this is incredible. Not many of you can write a check for $7.4 million, but when we do it together, you have this massive amount of money that is created from average ordinary people. I think that's extraordinary. Now, here's something that is a little bit off for me. Current statistics demonstrate that currently half of everyone that calls Bridgeway home gives. One out of every two. That's weird to me, because here's what's interesting. The idea that we should give to the Lord is already a done deal. Every believer should contribute to the Lord. The only question is where? Because God's got a lot of stuff going on, right? It's not just Bridgeway. It could be all over the place. This is not a plug for Bridgeway. But when I look and I go, oh, that's interesting. We did $7.4 million with half of us. That's crazy to me half of us? What would happen if all of us were involved? That's crazy, right? And then the statistics show that those of us that do give, the average giving is 6.3% of net income, meaning we're not even hitting 10% and starting. We've done all this with half people giving, and the people that do give don't even give 10%. That's wild to me. How does that work? And you go, well, that's a lot of money. Oh, I agree with you. I'm not complaining at all. Where does it go? Well, I found out at the last business meeting, a lot of you had ideas where it should go. <laughs> so let me tell you where it really goes, right? 52% of it goes to payroll. Why? Because people do ministry. 
it's not always stuff. It's usually just people. So we're trying to take care of the families that are around here. Besides, I have a winter home, a fall home, a spring home, and I, right? Who's going to pay for that? That's all I'm saying. We invest in people. That's just kind of how it works. 30% of it goes to being here on this location. And do you realize we moved here to save money? Right? Or did we ever? 18%, the last 18% is to do ministry day to day. Now, here's what's interesting. What does it all mean? It means that our location costs are fixed. So anytime our budget grows, it goes directly into people and ministry, not into location. Because those are already fixed. So if there's any increase or growth, we can put it right back into changing your lives and the lives of the people around us. So that's why we end up talking about it. Does that make sense? No one is complaining. Nobody's guilting. I feel extremely blessed to be in this church. I feel super thankful for all your generosity. I guess I'm asking the question of going, uh, do you see Bridgeway as something that is significantly doing things for the kingdom of God? And if so, maybe that means that we need to be thinking about, do we need to support what's going on here? Once again, I love talking about it when there's no pressure. I love talking about when we're not in trouble, we're not in any debt, we're not in any problems, we're doing fine. I'm asking you, what does God wanna do? That's what I'm talking about, right? So everyone kind of got excited and they started to do this and to give and God did something great. So then God highlights out, hey everybody, I need you to understand, the Holy Spirit has empowered Bezalel and his buddy Oholiab Those two guys are also gifted with the ability to teach. They're gonna run the project. They're the project managers. Everybody do exactly what they say. And he's about to launch the most beautiful and expensive project they've ever seen. There's a lot of beauty in this. Stones. The priests had breastplates of gold with a different gemstone for every tribe of Israel. There was gold sheeting, there was gold boxes and lampstands, there was beautiful embroidery, there was bright and vibrant colors. Why? I thought God wasn't into any of that stuff, right? God doesn't need any of that. God can be basic. God's about practicality. You sure? Let me ask you a question, does art matter? Does it matter to God? Apparently it does. Quick, quick show of hands, how many of you consider yourself artists doing art yourself of any medium? Raise your hand. What? Artists, are you an artist? Anybody an artist? Okay, cool, cool, a lot of you. Okay, real quick, how many of you can't create art on your own, but you would consider yourselves a lover of art? Raise your hands. Okay, one more group. How many of you are terrible at art, don't get it, and keep asking the question, what is it? Okay, fantastic, that's the rest of you. All right, in other words, we're all very different, right, when it comes to this whole concept of art, right? But art comes from the heart of God. It's his idea, he's the one that created it. Music is not from the devil, sculpture is not secular, creative writing isn't busy hands, drawing from our imagination isn't a waste of time. Acting is powerful. Writing music can change lives. Painting has rescued people from despair. It matters because art is one of the key ways that God expresses himself and draws people to him. So let's get practical. Do you guys know why there's so many lights on the stage when the band plays? Why? Because we need to be a better band than that church down the street. Isn't that what y'all think behind the scenes, right? It ain't cool till there's lights. Do you know what those lights are? These are different. These are practical lights so that you can see my expression and we can capture it on a camera for people at home. But do you know what the stage lighting is for? It's because not everybody is auditory. Not everybody can just stare at a guitarist. Some people need to be able to have a visual. 
And so we have a whole lighting team that comes in and uses their gifts to try to create emotion and mood and to grab people that are visual. That's their job. Every song is set differently. Every set is different. They work all week to create a very specific feel for every song. Why? Because some people have to see it for it to matter. Do you know why we have haze in the air? Because we get this question all the time. They're like, yeah, you're trying to be like spinal tap where it just all comes up right out of the ground and then I raise up out of the stage, right? That would be sweet. No, it's because if you don't have haze in the air, there are no particles for the light beams to catch and they diffuse and go all over. If you wanna have any shaft of light to move, you have to have something in the air. Well, I just thought you guys were trying to be cool. (laughs) We're trying to be practical because that's what visual looks like. Why is this backlit? Why does it look like this? Because some people are very atmospheric and it sets a tone for their spirit. It's the same reason why you wanna look at the cross, because you're visual, and it matters to you. Why do we have painters on stage? We have painters on stage because, have you ever seen a little child worship in front of you? Have you ever seen them dance before the Lord? It is so moving. You immediately go, oh my goodness, that little heart, and you're like, I wanna be like that. That's how visual people feel about a painter. Oh my goodness, they're creating right in front of me. That opens up my heart to God. What would I paint? Wow, they're taking the sermon. They get my notes in advance. And they work through and say, what would it look like if I was to paint a sermon? And they're painting a sermon for everyone that is not auditory. They're visual. Why do some people dance before the Lord? Because they wanna integrate their body and they believe that it's not a sin to move your hands beyond this. They feel the movement. They feel everything from the song and they say, God, you have my whole heart. You have my whole body. I just wanna be caught up in you. That's not bad, that's good. When we had a hobby night with artists, we had a resident artist who works with wood come here and he said, Pastor, I brought you a gift. And he opened up a box and it was a round, shiny uh, turtle. And it was made out of a coconut shell. And it, and it was this beautiful turtle. And I said, man, that turtle totally reminds me of Hawaii. He said, well, it's a Hawaiian coconut. I was over there, I, I took a coconut, and I began to draw the schematics on the plane on the way back. And I knew I wanted to give it to you. So I was fashioning out, and it was just specifically for you. I said, here's what you don't understand about why this is so powerful. You see, the turtle, I love animals. It reminds me of Hawaii. Hawaii was one of the greatest trips my family ever took. I got to be with my girls, I got to be with my wife, and we didn't have any burden, and you know why? Because you guys sent us. I was here for 20 years, and on my 20 year anniversary, you guys sent us all expenses to Hawaii. What that trip meant was not just for my family, it was the love of my spiritual family. My greatest memory is that trip in Hawaii with my family because my church loved me enough to send me. And that was all encapsulated by a turtle in a coconut shell that sits on my desk every day. Let me ask you, does art matter? Apparently it matters to God. Well, sure enough, the project manager comes to Moses and he's like, we have a problem. Pick it up in 36.5. Bezalel said to Moses, the people bring much more than is enough for doing the work that the Lord has commanded us to do. That's the problem. So Moses gave the command and the word was proclaimed throughout the camp. Let no man or woman do anything more for the contribution for the sanctuary. The people were restrained from bringing for the material they had was sufficient to do the work and more. That has never happened since. (laughs) What was the problem? Oh my gosh, stop giving. What is wrong with you people? Our bank account cannot handle this, right? We don't have enough accountants, right? I mean, it just sounds super funny, but it was practical that the people were giving so much that he was like, all right, we got it, we got it, we got it, got it, stop. All right, cool. What a sweet atmosphere that they were involved in. 
Well, it starts laying out how much everything cost, which is interesting in scripture. It says there was 2,195 pounds of gold used, 7,550 pounds of silver, 5,310 pounds of bronze. So I thought, you know what would be fun? I'm going to go through and see what it would cost to make the exact same thing today. So I went online and was checking all the current prices of gold per ounce and all that. I don't know if back then if gold was more valuable or less or if bronze was more or less. But here's what I found. This is a $64.5 million project. $64.5 million. And here's the most stunning thing. The actual tabernacle, not the courtyard. The courtyard held two items, but it was just a big... um, kind of white curtain that would keep everybody back. The actual tabernacle is 675 square feet. 675 square feet. They just spent $64.5 million on a 675 square foot building that only about eight people will ever see because nobody can go in. Only priests are allowed in, that's it. Now, the people that break it down and move it, they'll be able to see it in pieces, but they don't get to go in. $64.5 million on a 675-square-foot building that nobody gets to see. Why would God do that? Because he said, that's my place. Mm. Question for you. Are the cathedrals of the world... Those massive structures, are they glorious to God or the biggest waste of money? Well, think through it for a second. The longer you think through it, you're going to flip-flop on opinion <laughs> over and over and over and over because it depends, right? St. Peter's Basilica, the ceilings are 300 feet high. Why? Because it's supposed to draw you into the grandeur of God. You're supposed to come in and feel small. Well, that's expensive. You're supposed to see value everywhere you go. You're supposed to see an atmosphere. Why did the tabernacle have shimmering walls? There's something about the artwork, but that costs an awful lot of money. So let me ask you again. Do they matter? If we're going to talk about seven wonders of the world, how many are attached to God? If we're going to talk about big projects that took hundreds of years, how many are attached to God? Some of them are. What does it say to the world? Well, let me give you an example. I did some research real quick. You guys know the Taj Mahal in India? Uh, It was built in 1643. 1643 by a a man. Do you know why it was built? I didn't know this. It's a mausoleum. It is a burial place for his favorite wife. I like that line. (laughs) He's like, you can be buried over there. But her... It is a 42-acre complex, and in today's dollars would cost $70 billion. It took 20,000 people to build it. $70 billion for the grave of your favorite wife. Side note, my current favorite wife is Susie. Babe, I'm glad you're here. (laughs) Currently. Uh Uh Just saying, just saying. (laughs) Things can change. When the whole world looks and finds out that this was for her, what are they going to say? Wow, he must have loved her. Let me ask you again. What does it say to the world? What does it say to the world? Oh, I guess the Catholic Church really loved their God, right? Is that what it says? Or when you walk in and it's empty and it's dead, do you say there's no transformation here? What a waste. I don't know. It says a bunch of different things to different people. We got to be very careful. I get so conflicted. I went through this last year. I went to the Crystal Cathedral in, in Orange County. You guys ever driven by that? What a trip. You ever been inside it? Yeah. It was built only for TV. It has the worst acoustics out of any building. It's horrible for church inside live. It was not built for live. It was built for visual. Good thing, bad thing? I don't know. Right? Because a bunch of people come there all the time and it becomes a tourist attraction where people want to see and they go, wait, who built this? Why? God. Maybe God matters. Is it evangelistic? Is it not? I don't know. 
depends. So they finished the work. I love this line. Moses saw all the work and behold, they had done it just as the Lord had commanded and Moses blessed them. Everything was done. It was super cool. They had made these really neat uniforms for the priests. One of my favorite things about the uniform was that on their shoulders, they had onyx stones. Some scholars believe that they were inscribed with six names of each of the tribes on the, on the stone. But here's what's so cool about it. Everything they did, they carried the weight of the nation on their shoulders. And they would say, when I minister, I minister on behalf of my nation. When I pray, I pray on behalf of my nation. How incredible is that, right? It's this beautiful, rich blue over the white, and then there's like a gold tunic, and then there's a breastplate. They have a white turban, and it says, holy to the Lord on a nameplate right on their head. So they finish it all, but here's the big question. Will God like it? And that's where we close. Turn with me to chapter 40, verse 34. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of Yahweh filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because a cloud settled on it, and God filled it. Throughout all Israel's journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the people would set out. If the cloud wasn't taken up, they did not. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and fire was in it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. Y'all, I don't see any point of moving from the mountain to the promised land if God's not with you. So I don't know what your plans are for tomorrow, but a bunch of you are going to work. I'm not quite sure the point of going to work if God is not with you. So maybe we need to get our priorities straight, which is, am I right with God? Now I can go do stuff. So we're gonna close out by praying. And I'm just gonna say this, when I begin praying, if you feel like, Lord, I need more of you in my life, God, I want to pursue you. I'm just going to ask that you stand up during the prayer. Just stand up to the Lord. And we're just going to pray that he fills us with everything we give him. Amen? Let's close. (laughs) Heavenly Father, in this beautiful, holy moment, we cry out to you and we say, God, you are more than enough. We love you. and, And Lord, it's not that we are struggling and and you're stingy with your presence, it's that, God, we want to have the heart of Moses and say, Lord, we want more. Anything you're willing to give us, anything here at this church, in our youth group, amongst our children, anything in any of our ministries that you want, Lord, we want to say yes. We want the king of all creation, Jesus, you to walk in and say, that's ready for me. God, we ask that we would be able to limit self and move that away and allow you in. We pray, Lord, that we would begin to have good relationships and unity with one another so that, God, you can behold this place and be pleased and dwell among us. God, we pray more and more for your movement and your power and your glory because, God, when you're around, we fall in love with you more. Be with us now as we go. Holy Spirit, come and fill every one of us. Holy Spirit, anoint the altar as the prayer team comes, that your power is present here. In Jesus' name, amen.